Okay. Hello there. My name is Terrence McCray, and today, today's show is the Close the Deal Show. And what we're going to talk about today is where small business owners, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists identify a market, as well as by identifying a problem, and then creating a solution by pulling from their experiences. So in the future, I plan to have abundance of guests that are small business owners, that are actually nonprofit organization, people who started their own nonprofit. But today I have a guest that is an entrepreneur. Her name is Yara Getty Weinberg. She is a founder of Binown, a virtual building inspector. She has years of experience of managing and consulting, including at the Bain affiliate in Israel, TAS, as a tech consulting and as a lieutenant at the Israel Forces. Please welcome to the city, Mrs. Yara <laughs> Getty Weinberg. Hey, how are you doing, Travis? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show. I'm happy to be here. Definitely. Could you explain a virtual building inspector? Yeah. So Binoy attempts to solve a fascinating and exciting problem, and that is to help companies check and see if they're compliant with local building regulations to do that fully and fast. Now, that, that being said, Today, that's not the case. Right now, the processes are extremely lengthy, uh, and it's a lot of manpower working in order to ensure that the building is compliant with the local building regulations. And the, uh, I've, I've spoke with, uh, with a regulator who was, the, for 20 years, the, uh, one of the leading uh, regulators in San Francisco for a building, and he showed me his code book 20 years ago, okay. which was this big. Now the code book is this big. Wow. In pages and pages of complex codes and regulations. Okay. And so Binui's aspiration is to say, we know it's complex. We know it can not be done. We can make it simpler because buildings are continuously being more complicated. And so we'll create a solution that helps in the process. Now, we're very early stage, so this is our vision. For now, we're focusing on helping streamline the permitting process and getting to know our clients and, and testing out different solutions to solve the end goal of our, uh, of our problem. So that would be to completely do it, this fully automatic without any human testing it. Okay. For now, we're doing this as a, we're working side by side with our clients. Yeah. Have you worked with um, anyone recently um, in particular that um, people in the city may know of? Um, so Lawrence Cor uh, Cornfield is the uh, head of the building department who is retired that I spoke with, that showed that I spoke with. Um, Pat uh, Boschkovich is a permitting expediter, is one of the experts in San Francisco for permitting. He's a really fascinating person and worked very uh, uh, heavily on understanding both the history and defining the codes and regulations in San Francisco. So he's one of the leaders in defining the codes and regulations in San Francisco, and I spoke quite heavily with him as well. So those are pretty uh, interesting characters that if somebody that probably are very known to the SF uh, audience. Uh, though coming from Israel, I had to learn by meeting them how incredible they are and how valuable they were for the San Francisco uh, city and public. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. So is that very um, hard doing? What do you mean by that? Um, in regards to learning the code regulations, because you mentioned that early on there was a small percentage, oh, yeah. and then recently the volume has increased. So um, that's a very fascinating question, because really it is. And it's um, unlikely that somebody uh, 
a person will know by heart all the codes and regulations like they were expected to do 20 years ago. Okay. And so if the people who are supposed to check uh, the codes and regulations can't know them by heart, it's, it's quite easy to miss some of the codes that need to be checked. Could you give the city audience um, an mm -hmm. example of a specific code? Yeah. So the new uh, 24 title for uh, California building code, Cal Green, was just issued, uh, I think, a year ago. And it had a lot of interesting new uh, regulations. One of them, which I like to give because it's very minor, uh, and so you say, okay, if you need to think about that, what else do you need to realize and check, is about uh, bike parking. Okay. And bike parking, you need to have, um, you need to have for your public audience, bike parking at a certain amount, depending on the volume of parking that you're allowing that building. Uh, so in relations to that, you need to put that in a certain location and you need to define it very clearly in how you point that out uh, in the building. And so just for a very simple thing, build, putting a bike, bicycle, you have so many steps that you need to check. Now, that's a, the smallest one. It's only three elements. I didn't, but really if you try and codify it, which means if you try and break it down to the tiny elements of checks, okay. it comes down to even more, I think, between six and seven. So if that's a very small example, and now you have thousands and thousands, and that was a paragraph. If you have thousands and thousands of paragraphs, then you need to remember those rules. It's practically impossible to expect a person to do that and remember all of them and implement that in their checking process. And so, by using software, uh, you'll will be able to ensure that the codes are compliant uh, and the buildings are really compliant with the codes. But at the same time, that we make sure that the people who are implementing are understanding the spirit of the code, which is what they're doing now, and it's good and important, and they are focusing on how to improve our codes to the next level. So they're fully uh, safe, our buildings are fully safe, but at the same time, the, the communication and workflows with the industry and the building are better. Um, having said that, I'm really passionate about understanding that codes and regulations and complying with them mm -hmm are first and foremost interesting to the industry because if you need to make changes, if you don't figure that out ahead of time, it will cost you a lot of money and time to do that, which is very sh short and not accessible in construction, big construction projects. So that's where my passion is to help the industry uh, while working with the regulators. Yes, you've noted that you're um, an expert in consulting. Uh, yeah, I've been a consultant for many years. I have experience for about over five years in technology consulting and in strategy consulting, working lastly with TASC uh, in Israel, which is the main affiliate there, mm -hmm. uh, on working side by side with management, on figuring out solutions to strategy problems that they're facing or opportunities that they want to explore. Uh, so just for the audience who uh, may not heard about what strategy consulting uh, is and what uh, consultants do, let me just give kind of a brief overview Please for do. us. Uh, wonderful. So as a consultant, what you do is you're kind of uh, I would call it a commando workforce uh, for the management. They bring you in when there's a pressing question that they have, uh, a decision that they need to make as a management, and they need to solve it. And they need um, a lot of analytics done to understand what it is and recommendations based on that to see what is the process that they need to take. So, uh, for example, I was working with uh, one of the largest banks in Israel to define their mortgage uh, solution and to understand why is it not as profitable as the competitor's mortgage solution. Now, if we think about it, it's something that you, it's, 
it sounds clear, it sounds easy, but really it's not when you to understand the details. So you need to di dig down and dive into the grindy details of all the different elements that are affecting the mortgage product. For example, one of the elements would be the pricing. The other one would be the operations of the sales force, uh, the insurance that you put in on top of the product, uh, the uh, uh, mortgage product, and so on and so forth. And we looked at all of those elements, figured out where is the chunk of problem, uh, where is the money, the difference between the uh, the profits of the competitors versus our bank, which, uh, and then we, based on that, once we understood that, we were able to figure out the recommendations of what we need to do. Uh, so one example for recommendations that we uh, rec we laid out, and to to the I have to admit this was a client that was one of my favorites because they were so passionate that even before we finished implementing the analytics, even before we finished saying this is the problem, they were mm -hmm. like, okay, it seems like this is the problem, so I'm going to run with it. Like, wait, wait, let, <laughs> usually it's not the case. Usually we're the ones that are saying this is the problem, let's push it. He, he was pushing way before we were pushing. We're like, let's just make sure one, do a couple more tests to make sure this is, okay. our hypothesis is correct and I'll explain a bit more about what it is and that this is what we're recommending to do with this. But um, he pushed our recommendation so fast that uh, within only nine months, 400% uh, of the uh, profits were increasing. So that's a huge benefit for uh, both having the right strategy, but as I said, the right execution in place. So pushing it forward, believing it fully, and making sure that you do that correctly. Yeah. Well, is it okay for you to mention that company? No, okay. as, as consultant, as consultants, <laughs> yeah. we're we're not. We can tell uh, our insights and the story behind things, but we don't disclose the name of the company. Definitely, uh, it takes years before the strategies have passed, and then it's okay to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Definitely, you know. Um, I have a, another question for mm -hmm. you, uh, Mrs. Yar. Um, my question for you, as being a consultant, could you give me a circumstance where you have been successful? as a mm -hmm. consultant? Yeah, so, I mean, this project was really one example of it. And okay. what made it so successful for us to work with the, uh, with this bank, the one, the largest Israeli bank, um, is that we combine two things, really, as consultants, and that's what I also bring uh, to the table with me as expertise. One is that we understand the power of analytics and information. And we do that in two ways. One is the qualitative information, and two is the quantitative information. So the quantitative information is the numbers. Putting the numbers down, reading them, understanding the underlying trends in the numbers, getting to, to see the stories from the numbers. So for example, with, the, with this bank, looking into pages and pages of, uh, of financial reports, both from them and their competitors, understanding exactly what is going on there, cleaning out all the mess and, and, showing, the, uh, and showing what really is happening. The other one is the, quanti the qualitative. Qualitative is the soft aspect. And as, well, I'm in the tech industry and a lot of times, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the quantitative, which is right, because that's how you measure. And qualitative is soft, and so it's really hard to kind of show what you mean. It's mainly the stories, but they are the ones that are giving you the real indicators of figuring out the uh, bits and pieces in between the numbers. So in-depth interviews, such as the one we're doing here, but in other <laughs> formats, <laughs> okay. our, our mm -hmm. examples, or observing what's going on. So just shadowing people and seeing uh, what to do. And learning how to do both the quantitative and qualitative uh, elements there really helped me in understanding how to launch uh, Binui and how to build the product correctly by learning my audience from 
the analytical stan standpoint of realizing how that goes about and how you do that correctly and not fool yourself to think that you uh, you understand the numbers and then only later discover that it's not the case. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a fine example for someone mm -hmm. as a consultant in the field that you're in to share with the audience. You know, I have another question for you. Um, you know, we met through a mutual company by yeah. the name of Defy Ventures. That's true. And it's ironic that as a consultant, mm -hmm. you had to strategize how you wanted to give back. <laughs> so when you decided to give back, you know, what made you select Defy Ventures? Um, well, let's, let's define it into two, okay? okay. So we have um, the more simple answer, which was there was an opportunity that was there, and if I didn't know about it, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, so that's the simple part, which means I learn about DeFi mm -hmm. uh, by talking to the founder of DeFi. I think her name is Kate. Yes, uh, and, Catherine Hope. Uh, and I, she came to my MBA program and gave a really fascinating talk about her history and what drove her. And through that, I learned about DeFi and decided I want to uh, give back. But the reason that... I, I knew that from what she was def describing of DeFi is what I'm interested in giving back is because I choose to usually to go to places that I, when I volunteer, I use my expertise and I use that in my volunteering. So I want to, there are two types of uh, ways to volunteer. One is to say, I want to give back and I want to be as close as I can or um, to my audience of giving back, but I want to do something that's completely different from what I'm doing in day to day. I want to just, you know, um, for example, uh, providing food in, food in, uh, in shelters uh, or going and painting people's houses, uh, just giving back in other ways that are not your expertise. And that's that's kind of fun. I've done that also because you're both in you're both helping uh, the community, but at the same time you're doing something that's kind of new and refreshing to what you're doing. Definitely. Um, but my favorite type of volunteering is the one that you're you know that you have experience that you've built throughout your uh, life through your uh, your past experiences or current experiences. And that is harder to come by for people uh, from NGOs. And so if you can combine forces and work together using those expertise, you're providing a lot more value from your time. So at the same time, I feel I provide more value in. And that's kind of how um, I see how I see my volunteering. Where can I give the most value back when I, when I put my time and effort in something? How can I use my skills and my expertise to give back to the community? For me, it's sharing from my experience about uh, entrepreneurship, about strategy, analytics, understanding how to work in those workflows, uh, giving back by managing projects that I want to manage. Uh, so for example, I was managing the training for an NGO back in Israel that does strategy consulting for NGO, for other NGOs. So I've done both. I worked on strategy consulting for NGOs, mm -hmm. doing the same thing that I do in my day to day, just doing that with NGOs, but at the same time, managing events that are targeting the volunteers to train them to be better volunteers and better people all in all. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. So. My last question to you before we close the show is, what would you share with an entrepreneur? What one thing that you would give advice to an entrepreneur? One thing, wow, okay. Um, it, there's so many things just because as an entrepreneur, you realize two things. One is that it's not easy. If you wanna be an entrepreneur, uh, especially here we're in San Francisco this is the birthplace of entrepreneurship and a lot of visionaries want to make sure 
very much to my fault as well, right? I, I, I want to bring, I want to do better by my community. I want to bring something product to the world that helps. But uh, there is a lot of ups and downs that you don't see from the outside. You are so emotionally involved with your product that um, it is very uh, emotionally consuming and you need to be ready for that. But the other thing that I want to point out is that it, it's more about the one thing that you need to do is just take the step and do it. <laughs> and that's the hard part. Once, once you figure out that that's what you want to do, mm. once you know that this is the product you want to build, the hardest step is to take that. And so many people are wanting to do that and are too afraid. And if you've done that, uh, in Hebrew we say chapeau. It's like well done to you. That's incredibly uh, uh, inspiring that you're able to do that. And that in and of, on, and of itself is amazing. Yes, it is. Truly amazing. <laughs> well, I wish to thank you thank for coming you. on the show. Yeah. And I wish to let all the viewers know that the Close the Deal Show, if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to learn and find out more information how to start your business, please tune in. Because here, we're making deals, and those deals are to succeed. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great evening.